We'll turn with me to the book of John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14. And uh, this, you know, it's going to be a little bit different uh, message on a Wednesday night. We've been doing our Digging Deeper Discipleship. And uh, we're maybe going to take a little sidetrack for a week. And uh, it's interesting. I, I got a call on Tuesday. And a, a pastor called me. And he said, my mother just passed away. And I have to go up to uh, the, around the Pennsylvania area. And he said, I'm scheduled to do a funeral on Wednesday. And he said, it's with a, a couple. Their mom passed away. They would come out here from Washington. And uh, would you be willing to do the funeral and help out with that? And I, I'm willing. However, I, in the past, I've done a funeral before and not met with the family and didn't know anything about the family and it didn't turn out too good. And so it, it makes me very, very nervous, but the pastor asked me to and I said, if I can help out in any way, I will. And he said, well, I'll, I'll let you know. He said, I'll call the family, talk to them. I wanted to discuss this with you first. And so sure enough, a, a little bit later, he got in contact with me. He said, I talked with the family and uh, they were okay with that. They would like you to do that. And he said, oh, by the way, he said, I have this uh, paper about the lady who passed away named Christine Lazos, and uh, I'll send it to you. And I got that. I got uh, Christine Lazos' uh, little PDF, and uh, you see it right here. And the title of this is This Is My Story. This is my story. So I, I sat down there, and I began, I printed it off, and I began to read this eight-page story of Miss Lazo's life. And fascinating, fascinating her childhood growing up. I'll discuss that in a, in a little bit. But the title of the message comes uh, from this, This is My Story. And we're going to look here in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And she mentions John chapter 14 at the end of what she wrote up here. So if we can uh, look there in John chapter 14, stand for the reading of God's word if you can. And I'll read verse number 1. We'll read every other verse until we get to verse number 6. And I'll start in verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And a wonderful, wonderful verse. That verse number six, at the end of her story of writing, she quotes that verse about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I got on the phone with her daughter, Barbara Ann. And Barbara Ann, her husband, Keith, are from Washington. They go to an independent uh, Bible-believing King James Bible Baptist Church in Washington, and we began to talk, and uh, she said she would like me to be a, a part of the funeral, and uh, oh, this is my story. Miss Christine Lazos has a wonderful story. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you, and Lord, it's a, a little different type of sermon. I think it's very helpful for all of us to think and hear it, and Lord, help us to realize that we all have a story. And uh, Lord, I pray that you help us, whether we're young or old, to fill in those blanks of the story that we're living and make them blanks that are lived for you, that are turned into living to, for you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you bless this. We love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Christine Lazos. I read her story, and I read it all the way through. Fascinating. And it told about her childhood growing up by looked up on the internet or house growing up that she grew up in, in Pennsylvania, 127 High Street in Shill, uh, Shill Hill Haven, Pennsylvania. If I say that wrong, forgive me. It's a little town uh, to the west of Pennsylvania, uh, of, of Philadelphia and a little bit north of Lancaster. And it was just a little house. And she grew up in this little town. But uh, the next day on Wednesday, I prepared for 
the family. Uh, it was interesting. The funeral was a slightly different. They met at the grave side uh, first. So I went out there to the Memorial Gardens and uh, got there early, but I couldn't find the family. It's a big graveyard, and I'm driving around looking for it. I pulled up to the front there to the funeral home, and I decided I'll take it one more time, and I began to drive through, and there I found a graveside service that was about to begin. I got there about 10 minutes early, and I got out there, and you know, you're walking into a group of people you've never met. And uh, so I walked up, and I'm nervous as can be, a graveside service. I don't, I, I asked them, do you have an order of service? Do you have what you want done? And said, oh yeah, we've already got everything taken care of. But often, they don't exactly know what they want. And uh, I got to the graveside, and found out that I'm running the graveside and I'm to leave the order of service in the graveside. I met her, Barbara Ann, uh, talked to her husband, and she's a, a godly woman, loves God, living for God. And she's concerned about her brothers, Drew, and her brother Gregory. And I met them, and the family's there gathered around, and it's time to start. Uh, so I welcome the family. Once again, I don't know any of them. I'm Pastor Matt Nettesheim. And uh, we're gathered here in remembrance of Christine Lazos. And uh, I said, a Bible verse that I would like to read is Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. And at the graveside, often you, you take time and it's short. It's a, the family saying goodbye to mom. And so it was short. We had prayer and uh, we reminded them that her days were filled with uh, uh, fullness of the, where it says, my cup runneth over. Her life was a, a cup running over for the Lord, but then also reminded that uh, though, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, though we are having a, a dear lady who's 91 years of age passing on into eternity, we don't have to fear no evil because God's with us. And I, I mentioned the verse, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And we prayed, the family then took these roses, placed them on the casket, there was some emotion, there was some tears, there were some hugs, there was some uh, fellowship there. And then it's time to go over to the funeral home. The funeral starts at 11 o'clock. And so I get in my car and I begin to go towards the funeral home and uh, got there and uh, got there a little bit earlier than some of the family and got in there. And I'd never been to this funeral home. It was off of Virginia Beach Boulevard, Rosemont area. And uh, they had an order of service, some songs. They asked me to lead the singing of the songs. Uh, they had an organ player that knows all of the songs, so I chatted with the organ player. And then I began to meet some people. They were preparing some food. I met a lady that she went to church with when uh, Miss Christine lived in the area. And they began to discuss uh, in the 1950s and 60s, a pastor Woodyard. And uh, they began to discuss that. And uh, Oh, I was nervous as can be. And I talked to Miss Barbara Ann, and I said, Miss Barbara Ann, could I just read this? You want me to do the eulogy. The eulogy is discussing somebody's life. Can I just read this? And she said, oh, that would be a wonderful idea. She wrote that 15 years ago, and I only gave that to her, her two sons, my brothers. Probably most people here have never even heard or know that that's in existence. They wouldn't even know about that. That would be wonderful. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. The service, it's about 11 o'clock. There's still people flowing in there. I went up to the family and uh, I said, well, would you like me to start the service? And the one son, there was a son there named Drew. He's ready to be on and done with this. And he says, we ought to just start on time, just start on time. So I got up there and I welcomed everybody and I began to lead in prayer. And one of the songs they, they wanted was called Blessed Assurance. So I began to lead in the singing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The organ player started at a high octave right there. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fool. And I squeaked a few times. And my stomach is churning. I'm nervous. Uh, but this is my story. This is my song. This is my story. This is my song. You know, she got the title of her write-up right there from, I believe, that song, This Is My Story. They wanted blessed assurance because her story was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And then after I got done leading that song right there, Barbara Ann got up 
and she began to tell of some memories that she had as a child, and she gave the gospel to her family. She poured out her heart, and she was begging her family to trust Christ as her Savior. She mentioned, if you don't trust Christ as your Savior, you're going to burn in hell forever. And then after I got up, I began to take this story, this is my story, and I began to read it. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and I'm going to read just brief mentions of it. Christine Saul was born August 28, 1929, in our house on 127 High Street in Sherrill Hill, Haven, Pennsylvania. My mother was Edna Saul, and my father was Stuart. I had one older brother, Kenneth, and I was the second in line. Our home was not large, but always had plenty of love. We had a living room with bay window, and we could look up and down High Street. In the dining room was a cellar door. Down there, mother kept all her canned goods lined up on the shelves. By the way, I'm having a hard time reading this right now without my glasses, but right before I got up there, my glasses broke. And uh, I was running around looking for a piece. Thank you, Brother Randy. You're merciful to me right there. They're going to fall and break again, aren't they? And uh, begin reading that. But, oh, these are like triple power right there. <laughs> these, I really needed these. These things are great. Uh, the three bedrooms were upstairs and uh, were not heated, only the bathroom. Our kitchen had a table with an extension that Grandpa Reber had added. Grandpa also built us a bench. We would come home each day from school for dinner. Mother cooked our big meal then. Daddy came home too. We had no car. And so we walked back and forth to the casket factory where he worked as a casket trimmer. He did beautiful work with the satin linings, holding a mouthful of tacks and retrieving them with a magnetic head hammer. Every summer, Daddy picked up wild currants, blackberries, and elderberries. Mother made jam and jelly to last the winter. Now, you're, just follow with me. You're going to learn a little bit about this Christine Lazos. And it's an interesting story. It's like a, you go back into time a little bit into the history of the United States into a small town in Pennsylvania. Every summer, Daddy picked the wild currants. On Saturday nights, we usually ate mush and milk while listening uh, to Professor Kilt Coltmore Kindergarten. There was no TV in those days, and so we had ra uh, favorite radio programs we enjoyed. The Jack Benny Show, Captain Shadow, and the Green Hornet. Our elementary school was at the foot of High Street, so we could get there in less than five minutes. I remember at Easter, she surprised us, our teacher, with a rabbit in the classroom. We were told to put our heads on the desk and were allowed to look up. There was a rabbit surrounded by Easter candy for each of us. On the 4th of July evenings, we'd go across to High Street and watch the fireworks. There was a vacant lot, and we'd go sledding in the winter. Every Sunday, our whole family walked to Sunday school and stayed for church. There was another 15-minute walk. Uh, then at night, we'd go to Vespers. With Janice and David were small, they were pushed in the wicker stroller. Um, on Christmas morning, there was a church service that started at 6 a.m. I remember walking to church in the dark and hearing the crunch of the snow under our boots. We sang in the children's choir at church. Since our bedrooms were cold, we couldn't do our homework there, so we sat around the kitchen and dining room table. Mother helped us, and if she didn't know the answer, we went to Grandpa Reber. He was a former country school teacher. Grandpa Reber's sister, Anne, gave us a piano, with, and we learned lots of music. Um, she... Uh, gave us, there was piano lessons. Uh, she lived about a block away and charged 25 cents a lesson. Mother had, had none of the modern convenience. We uh, take so much for granted today. Her refrigerator was an ice box. In the summer, the iceman came with 15 to 25 pounds of ice to put in the refrigerator. Mother had one day of the week uh, for chores. On Monday, she did washing. Tuesday was ironing. Wednesday was probably mending day. Mother made sure we had milk, molasses, summer sausage, and apples. She was very good at stretching the food. Our bedrooms all had adjoining doors since there was no hallway. Janice and I slept in the middle room and the boys in the back room, and it often caused trouble when the boys came through and began teasing and screaming, and we would scream. Daddy often came up the stairs to stop the fight. Since we had no car, Mother's Uncle John sometimes took us out for Sunday drive. During World War II, people were asked to have victory gardens. Daddy had a big one, that, uh, the big one on the lot above us. Mother canned everything. Daddy also raised and killed rabbits for our food. At Easter time, we would sell the little bunnies. It was the boy's job to feed and water the rabbits and clean their pens. The prettiest one became pets, but we still had to kill and eat them for Sunday dinner. Then the boys would tease us by saying, poor Whitey, or whatever its name. Rabbit stew was very tasty, but knowing which rabbit, we sometimes lost our appetite. 
Mother sewed lots of clothes for Janice and me. We were two years apart, but we were usually dressed as twins. I remember the molasses taffy mother would make for us. It was so good and fun to pull. She made it plain and chocolate. Janice got piano lessons too, and we would sometimes have home concerts with duets, solos, and sing too. Daddy also played the piano by ear and sang. We harmonized well. We had uh, lots of musical times together. When I was a teenager, Aunt Helen took me to a concert in Pottsville where I learned to appreciate good music. As kids, we all had childhood diseases, measles, mumps, and chicken pox. In those days, the health department hung a quarantine sign on the house so no one would enter. It was a happy household with plenty of discipline and lots of love. We always had a big Christmas tree at home and each child received one toy and a new garment. Things were not wrapped up in decorative paper but usually given in the paper bag in which they were bought. It didn't matter to us as we didn't know the difference. We children would exchange gifts with each other too, maybe just a sucker or a piece of gum. One year my desire was for a can of peaches. I remember being delighted with the simple but delicious gift from mother and daddy. Ours was a family that believed in God. We remember, I remember coming downstairs in the morning to find my mother reading her Bible in a big wing back chair. I also remember Daddy kneeling at the bathtub to pray because it was too cold in the bedroom. We always thanked the Lord for our food at mealtime and knelt at our bed at night to pray. Allowances for children were unheard of. So to earn little money, kids in the town went to door with a basket of small bags of chips and peanuts and cashews. We'd maybe get 10 to 15 cents selling a few bags. Uh, when we were taken to buy shoes in those days, the shoe store had a machine that would take an x-ray of your foot in the new shoes to make sure that they were a perfect fit. You would just stand in front of it and slip your foot in while looking through a window that showed you how your foot was spaced in the shoe. I guess that that would be outlawed today. When it came time for me to be confirmed in the Lutheran church and my parents couldn't afford a new dress by my brother Kenneth, uh, my brother Kenneth paid for my white confirmation dress. He was earning money while working at the A&P store as a checker. When I was 16 years of age, I got a job at Reed's Mill, an underwear factory where I was a folder. The supervisor in my department was a little woman with beady eyes behind thick glasses who watched me closely. I dubbed her Eagle Eyes. The day after I graduated from high school, I was hired as a telephone operator. My employer went to our church. We had an eight-position switchboard and had a plug in which we saw light. We'd ask, number please, and then ring the number for that customer. If there was a crackle, then we would try to plug it in. We would say, the line is busy. Or if it rang a number of times with no response, we'd say, sorry, no answer. We worked all different shifts. One time, I guess I forgot the buzzer and I fell asleep. The repair service was called and they had a key to get in. The lights were flashing all over the switchboard with customers waiting for me to answer. It's a wonder I wasn't fired. Sometimes when we had a long break at work, we'd go across the street to the candy kitchen to buy a milkshake. Sometimes the owner's son waited on us. That was Paul Lazos. He always had some funny things to say and made us laugh. My friend told me he's a nice guy for me. Then one day, Paul asked me to go with him to buy supplies for the store, and we went to Reading, Pennsylvania. After that, we dated often, and afterwards, he'd take me to my, his dad's store for a milkshake. We started going to choir practice and church together. Then mother would invite him for Sunday dinner. He got along well with all the family, and they all liked him. He then decided to enlist in the Navy. He got sent off, and we got married in Memphis, Tennessee, with his cousin and wife over our tents because they were there. We went to a new duty station in Jacksonville, Florida, then to Memphis, Tennessee. Paul said he never wanted to have duty in Oceana, but after a short stint in Chicoteague, we were transferred to Oceana, where Paul was attached to a squadron. That meant sea duty, and he had several six-month cruises. These were hard for me, the children, and for Paul to be separated for so long, but we got through. Now... It's a lot of reasoning, but I wanted to get to this point. And, and you think with me, 15 years ago, Christine Lazos wrote this, really wrote it for her family. And there was a point, she was getting somewhere with this. And here's where she was getting to. We found a house in Virginia Beach in a nice, quiet neighborhood and raised our children there. We got involved in a Lutheran church as we always did because we were both brought up in the Lutheran church. I can't say I ever heard the gospel message there, but, we is, but was taught since we were confirmed members of the Lutheran church and lived moral lives with good deeds that we would go to heaven at the time of death. I always wondered if I had done enough good to be accepted. Our church had a, a small group called the 70. The pastor was our teacher, but the book we studied was not the Bible. I hoped that someday I could study the Bible and get more understanding of it. About that time, Barbara Ann was around 10 years of age and I was thinking of the Girl Scouts for her. 
Greg had already joined the Boy Scouts from a girlfriend of hers. We were told of the Pioneer Girls, a Christian club. I was asked to be an assistant leader of each week, and each week they had a Bible exploration for 15 minutes, which meant studying it and hearing the gospel, the good news. When I was giving piano lessons to, uh, to an adult, she told me of a neighborhood Bible study that she attended and asked if I could go. There I also heard the plan of salvation, how Jesus had died in my place for my sin so that I could be in a right relationship with God and go to heaven when I die. All I had to do was confess or agree that I was a sinner and believe that Jesus died for me. My sister Janice came home on furlough just then from her mission field in Vietnam. I asked her if there was anything to this plan of salvation as it was so different from anything I'd ever heard in the Lutheran church. She opened her Bible and shared verses with me. The one that stuck out to me was John chapter 14, verse six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, come, come, uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There it was in a nutshell. I believed and got on my knees and told the Lord I was a sinner and needed the blood of Christ to save me. Since then, I am a new creation. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Got done reading that, and uh, it was time to open up the Bible and give a message. So I gave the message, and thinking about this is my story, we all have a story. And this story right here in John chapter 13 and 14, our Sunday school lessons the next two weeks are from John chapter 13 and 14. We all have a story. Jesus was about to ascend, uh, about to die on the cross for our sins. He gathered the disciples. He washed the feet of the disciples. He told them, I'm leaving you. And uh, he had that, that conversation with Peter where, Peter, you're going to deny me. The, the, the disciples were troubled. And then John chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And the sermon that I gave is, in reality, there are many mansions in heaven. And we don't have to feel sorry for Miss Christine. She's up there in heaven at the feet of Jesus. She has her mansion. She's, she's okay. But as it got a little bit further, Thomas was confused. Lord, uh, how can we know the way? How can we know about that place of many mansions? Jesus said, I am the way. And the first part of the message was Jesus is the way. And, and it's important. I looked out at that crowd, a lot of family members, a lot of people there. And I said, Christine would want to, to be remembered. Her story was that she had trusted Jesus Christ as the way to heaven. Amen. She trusted Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. It's not your works. It's not your goodness. It's not you keeping on living right. There's none good. No, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeketh after God. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we've heard the gospel, but it's very important that we never forget that Jesus is the way. We can't live the Christian life unless first we become a Christian and get gloriously saved. And, and she wanted it to be known. She wrote that for her family. She wrote her own eulogy, her life story was Jesus is the way. She looked back. The highlight of her life was somebody taking the word of God and showing her that Jesus is the way. But also, Jesus is not only the way, but he's the truth. And uh, Jesus is the way, the truth. And it's important to understand the truth. God's word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And it's not just getting gloriously saved, but the privilege we have, have of having the Bible as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Now, you've heard messages from John chapter 14 a thousand times, most of you. But, but think about, it. is there a more simplistic, easy pattern for our story for our lives than trusting Christ as our Savior, following the Bible as truth, and living the abundant life, living for Jesus? It's simple, hey, Jesus is the way to heaven, following the Bible day by day by faith, living by faith, trusting the word of God. And we, we understand that, you, you get to the end of this. I, I, it was like at the end of the, the, the service, the, the service of the funeral, after reading her story three times, I recorded that story, listened to it. It was like I knew Christine. I looked where she lived. 
And one day I thought about it. She's looking down for him and watching me give the gospel, encouraging her family to trust Christ as Savior, begging the people to trust Christ as Savior, begging them not only to trust Christ as Savior, but begin to live by the book, live for the Lord, and then live the abundant Christian life. One day, it dawned on me, and it sounds funny, but it's real. One day I'm going to die, and I'm going to get up there, and she's going to say, hey, pastor, I just wanted to, you to know that I'm up here, and you preached my funeral. And then... Hey, you mentioned that, but you should have said it this way. <laughs> and she'd be right. Uh, but, but, you know, it's real. And, and really, the Digging Deeper Discipleship, we all have to choose about our story of our life. You can't cr- change the past, but what you and I can do is we can make sure that we've trusted Christ as our Savior. Amen. And maybe, maybe, maybe even in here tonight, There's one of you who thought that your goodness, maybe Jesus plus your goodness gets you to heaven. Maybe you've thought that. But you need to catch you out of the equation. You'll never be good enough. And to think you'll ever be good enough, it's impossible. Jesus is the way, the way, the way. He's the only way to heaven. And it's important. Our our, our righteousness is as filthy rats. And it's not by works of righteousness which I've done, but according to his mercy he saved us. For by grace he saved through faith, and not of yourselves, of yourselves at all. You can't keep your salvation. You'd lose it. If you try to keep your, you're not good enough. You wouldn't be able to do it. But Jesus keeps that salvation. You're trusting him and him alone for heaven. But then also the truth. Boy, let us be people that we live by the truth. This world's gone mad. It has gone mad. But we have something truthful. And I mentioned in the sermon, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, you can't believe everything you read on the Internet. And he's right. He's right. You know, he's right. It's true what he said. And uh, but the one thing that we do have that's truth is the word of God. You can trust it. You can believe it. And then it's a good life. And uh, young kids that are here, those teenagers that saying there's so many flashing lights that try to get you to live on something else. And it's a terrible way to live. The abundant life, the best life, is living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this lady, Christine Lazos, she had a story, and it's a story that is worthy of being told, and her story was Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And maybe this sermon was for me tonight. And it's a good reminder, it's a simplistic truth that I... As a pastor, as a dad, I just need to keep uh, the church simple, trying to bring people to you as far as salvation, trying to just teach people the word of God and keep on living the abundant life, Lord. Lord, I pray that maybe there's somebody here, maybe uh, an older man, maybe a younger woman, maybe a boy, maybe a girl that's never trusted you as their savior, or even thought that it's Jesus, you Jesus, plus their works that get to heaven. I pray that right now, They even under their breath, they don't have to do it publicly, but they just say, Lord, save me. I can't do it myself and help them to be born again. Lord, I pray that you help somebody who's been struggling with the truth just to simply believe and trust in your word. And Lord, I pray that you help us to be a church filled with people, young and old, that are living the abundant life. I pray for the family. I pray for the two sons. I pray for the grandchildren and there's even great grandchildren involved. And I pray that somehow those grandchildren see the life, the story of Miss Christine Lazos' life, and realize that she was a Christian woman that loved you. And I pray that they, they get saved. I pray that they live for you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for this time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.